Hi, this is joint work with Ilan Kumar Gotsi. Very broadly, this work is about proving limitations on the best possible time space trade off attacks for finding short collisions in Merkle network. Hash functions are one of the fundamental primitives of cryptography that have many different applications. Certain applications, like password hashing, etc., require a hash function to handle different input levels. However, it is infeasible to design a different hash function for every length. Hence, iterative hashing is used to construct variable input length hash function using fixed input length primitive. Some popular iterative hashing mechanisms are the Merkle Damgaard construction and the sponge construction. Our focus for this talk is the Merkle Damgaard construction. Uh, it is based on a compression function H that takes as input two values lying in one through n and outputs a value in one through n. The hash of a message m is defined with respect to a hash key a, also known as the salt, as follows. m is padded up to an appropriate length and then broken up into blocks such that each block lies in one through n. The compression function is first evaluated using the salt and the first message block. Next, it is evaluated uh, again using the first output along with the second message block and so on. The output produced by the final evaluation uh, of the compression function is the hash of M with respect to the salt A. This construction is used in MD5, SHA1, and SHA2. One very fundamental property that we want any hash function to satisfy is that of collision resistance. Uh, that is, uh, given a random sort, it must be hard to find two distinct messages that hash to the same value. We are interested in quantifying the collision resistance of the merkle damgaard construction. The most common approach used in doing this is to model the compression function H as a random or uh, when doing so, uh, one can find collisions using roughly square root n queries to the random order. Uh, this is essentially the birthday attack, and this attack is optimal. But typically, uh, h is a public function, uh, and the adversary might be able to do a lot of pre-processing on it. And it turns out that this birthday style attack is no longer the best one uh, when considering adversaries that can do pre-processing on the random order. The scenario of pre-processing adversaries were studied in many earlier works, for example, in the context of function inversion, collision resistance, etc. The auxiliary input random oracle model introduced by Unruh captures the power of pre-processing adversaries against random oracle. The collision resistance game in this model is formalized as follows. An adversary is modeled as a two phase one. Uh, its pre processing phase gets full access to the random oracle and it outputs S bits, uh, which is passed on uh, to the online phase, which additionally gets as input a uh, randomly sampled salt A. The online phase can make at most T queries to the random oracle, and the adversary wins if the online phase outputs two distinct messages which have the same hash with respect to the salt A. Uh, we refer to such an adversary A as an ST adversary. We parameterize the advantage in terms of S and T and define it to be the maximum probability of any ST adversary winning in this game. Uh, we note that in allowing the adversary to compute any arbitrary S bits of pre-processing, we make it very powerful. Hence, any limitations proved in this model imply very strong guarantee. Coretti et al. gave a tight characterization of this advantage in terms of S and T. That is, uh, they proved an asymptotic upper bound of uh, ST squared by N on the advantage of any ST adversary and also gave an attack that achieves this advantage. However, uh, their attack finds collisions of length nearly T. Now, say that an attack takes time to power 60. Yeah, it means that the collision that it finds is uh, petabytes long. Uh, collisions that long 
are not really useful for any uh, practical purposes. In addition, short collisions are harder to find than longer ones. This was uh, proven by Akshima et al. Here, the two in the subscript uh, denotes the uh, advantage of an ST adversary in finding two block collisions. That is collisions where both the messages are at most two blocks long. Uh, Akshima et al showed that the advantage for finding two block collisions is upper bounded uh, symptotically by ST by N plus T square by N. And this result implies that the two block collisions are harder to find than arbitrary length one. Further, in the same work, uh, they gave an attack uh, that has advantage uh, roughly STB by N plus T square by N, ignoring the polylog factor. Uh, we refer to this attack as the STB attack. They also put uh, forth a conjecture uh, called the STB conjecture, which says that the STB attack is asymptotically optimal for any value of T. Uh, before our work, uh, this uh, conjecture was unresolved for any value of B that is at least three, but much less than T. In this work, we show that this conjecture is true for all constant values of B uh, and for certain other range of parameters. Our two results are incomparable. Uh, I will cover the proof of the conjecture for all constant values of B in the rest of this talk. I refer you to our paper for the details of the other result. Also, I should note that uh, this second result was recently improved upon in a follow-up work by Akshima, Go, and Liu. This is the main theorem that we proved. Uh, we show that the maximum ad advantage of an ST adversary in finding a B block collision is asymptotically upper bounded by ST B squared times log s power b whole divided by n plus t square over n. For constant values of b, uh, this is asymptotically st by n plus t square o by n, ignoring uh, the polylog factors. Uh, this proves the stb conjecture for all constant values of b. The proof of this theorem is based on the multi-instance framework uh, recently introduced in the works of Chung et al and Akshima et al. Uh, this framework was inspired by the beautiful techniques it used to prove a constructive churn of bounds uh, by Impagliazzo and Kamanets. Uh, here is a very brief description of the framework. First, U different salts A1 through AU are sampled uniformly at random. The online phase of the adversary gets some fixed pre-processing independent of the uh, uh, random oracle, say the all zero string, uh, and the uh, random salt A1. It can make at most T queries to the random oracle, and it needs to output a B block collision. Uh, next, the online phase of the adversary is successively run on the other sample salt. The adversary wins the multi-instance game if it successfully finds a B-block collision for every sort. The multi-instance lemma relates the maximum advantage of an ST adversary in finding a B-block collision to the maximum probability of an adversary winning the multi-instance game, which we refer to using epsilon. Uh, in more detail, the lemma shows that when U is S plus log N, uh, the maximum advantage of any ST adversary in finding a B block collision is upper bounded by at most uh, epsilon power one by U. Uh, we will prove that uh, epsilon is in turn upper uh, bounded by this quantity here, uh, which for constant values of B and U equals S plus log N is asymptotically in the order of ST by N plus T squared by N power U. Uh, ignoring the polylog factors. Uh, applying the multi-instance lemma uh, would give us the upper bound that we set out to prove on the maximum advantage of an ST adversary in finding B-block collisions. So we need to upper bound the maximum advantage of the adversary against the multi-instance game. We shall do this using a compression argument. Uh, the main idea behind a compression argument, uh, which is formalized in the lemma here, uh, 
uh, is that it is impossible to compress a random element in the set X to a string shorter than log of size of X bits long, even relative to a random string. Recall that our goal is to upper bound the advantage of an adversary in winning this multi-instance game. Our strategy uh, will be to come up with an encoding and decoding procedure uh, for the random oracle H and the random solves A1 through AU, uh, that, uh, which uses this adversary, such that uh, the decoding procedure is correct whenever this adversary will. Using the, the compression lemma would then lead us to an upper bound on the maximum probability of the adversary winning the multi-instance game. Before starting uh, with the encoding procedure, uh, let us make this following simplifying assumption that when the adversary, multi-instance game adversary runs on a particular salt, it only queries the random oracle on uh, values uh, prefixed by the particular salt. Of course, this assumption is false, but we will make it initially for the ease of exposition and remove it later on in the talk. Note that this assumption in particular implies that the query made by uh, the multi-instance adversary when running on different solves are completely different. The encoding procedure works as follows. Uh, the adversary is first run on the salt A1, and this salt is included as part of the encoding. Uh, when the adversary makes a query to the random oracle, the answer to that query is added to uh, a list in the encoding. If the adversary makes a query uh, that had not been made before, but which has the same answer uh, as some previous query, then uh, the answer to this query is removed from the uh, list of answers in the encoding. And instead, the indices of the two queries with the same answer is added to a separate list of tuples in the encoding. This is done only for the first time this happens when the adversary is running on the salt A1. Similarly, the adversary is run on the other uh, solves one by one and the encoding built up likewise. After running on all the solves, uh, the points of the random oracle on which the adversary did not query it are appended to the list of uh, the answers to, to random oracle queries in the lexicographical order of inputs. Uh, that's, that completes the encoding procedure. procedure. Uh, now, uh, let me show you how uh, decoding works. The adversary is first run on salt A1, which is present in the encoding, and its query is answered uh, from the list of answers in the encoding. When a query uh, is made whose answer was removed from the list, the said query is detected by checking if the query uh, index appears as the second element of uh, a tuple uh, in the li uh, list of tuples in the encoding. If so, it is answered with the query answer of the uh, query whose index appears as the first element of the tuple. Similarly, the adversary is run on all the other solves. And finally, the unqueried values of H are deduced from the remaining entries uh, of the list of answers, uh, which are in the lexicographical order of inputs. Whenever the adversary wins a multi-instance game, uh, we are guaranteed to have a collision for every salt. And since by our assumption, the adversary makes uh, completely different queries for different salts, it follows that we save u times log n minus two log t bits in total. Since for every salt, instead of remembering a query answer, we included our tuple of query indices to the encoding, uh, which take log t bits each. Using the compression lemma, this would give us that the advantage of the adversary against the multi-instance game is at most t squared by n whole power u, uh, which is what we want. But remember, uh, we made a false assumption. Uh, so we have to work much harder to get rid of it. To this end, as a first step, we introduce the notion of a query graph. Uh, this is a graph that is initially empty. Uh, when we start running the adversary on the salt A1, 
if it makes a query on uh, x, uh, a random oracle query on x1, y1, and the answer is z1, we add two nodes for x1 and z1 and add a directed edge from x1 to z1 with label y1. Next, when it makes a random oracle query on z1, y2, and the answer is z2, we add a node z2 and add a directed edge from z1 to z2 with label y2 and so on. The graph grows as we run the adversary on all the USALs. Uh, in particular, note that uh, the adversary when running on a uh, salt may make queries that it made earlier while running on a different salt, contrary to our earlier assumption. Uh, we can assume uh, without loss of generality that whenever the adversary uh, finds the collision, it must have queried uh, the random oracle at all points required to compute the collision. So let us first see how a B block collision looks like in a query graph. A general B block collision is a subgraph of the query graph uh, that looks something like this. This reminded us of the shape of a mouse, hence uh, we named it the mouse structure and referred to the different parts of the subgraph uh, using different body parts. Note that there can be slight variations to the structure. Uh, the entire body of the mouse might be a cycle or even a self loop. The tail might be missing, etc. For every salt that the multi instance adversary is run on, even if it finds multiple B block collisions, we arbitrarily choose one of the collisions and refer to its subgraph uh, as the mouse structure for the particular salt. Next, we categorize the types of queries made when the adversary is run on different solves. Uh, we say that a query is new if it is being made for the first time. Uh, we will assume without loss of generality that when running on a particular salt, the adversary does not repeat queries since it can just store the answers. So if a particular uh, query had not been made when the adversary was run on a prior salt, uh, the query is new. Uh, we'll mark the new queries with red. Queries that are not new are repeated queries. Uh, we will categorize them into two types. Uh, repeated mouse queries are those that are present in the mouse structure of some uh, earlier sort. Uh, we mark these in blue. Any repeated query, uh, any other repeated query is called a uh, repeated non mouse query, and we uh, mark these in green. Uh, further, uh, we'll make an assumption here. Uh, we assume that before running the adversary on a salt, uh, no query with the particular salt as prefix has been made. Uh, we will soon show the, why making this assumption is justified. Uh, uh, note that this implies that every mouse structure has a new query. Uh, based on these definitions, we classify the mouse structures into different categories. Uh, these categories are not mutually exclusive, but they are exhaustive. A mouse structure gets classified into the earliest category that it falls in. The first category is when there are uh, colliding new queries in the mouse structure. Uh, the queries in black may be of any type, new repeated mouse or repeated non -mouse. The second category uh, is of mouse structures whose body is a self loop. And third is of mouse structures that have a new query whose answer is the input salt of a repeated mouse query. Uh, the two other mouse structure categories are the ones that have at least one repeated mouse query and ones that have no repeated mouse queries at all. Our goal will be to save at least the following uh, amount of bits for each of these mouse structure categories. Uh, we refer to this quantity as delta. Uh, this leads uh, us to a saving of at least u delta bits in total. And this suffices since uh, applying the compression lemma uh, would give us the bound that we want. Uh, before we describe how we save, uh, let me address the assumption that we made. That is, when running on a salt, the adversary had not made any query prefix with that salt uh, when running on the earlier salts. 
this is reasonable since otherwise we can save enough on the salt itself uh we save at least delta bits as follows uh, we omit this, uh, so the salt from the encoding, the saving log n bits. Instead, uh, write down the index of the query where the salt appears as, a, as the part of the encoding. Since there are at most u times t queries, uh, this costs us at most uh, log of u t bits. Uh, and uh, that suffices for our needs. Thus, we can make this assumption as we showed that otherwise we already save enough. Uh, we first show how to deal with some of the easier cases. Uh, consider the case uh, when the mouse structure has colliding new queries. Uh, suppose the new queries are Q1 and Q2 with Q2 made after Q1. Here, uh, we save log n bits by omitting the answer of Q2 from the encoding and instead remembering the indices of Q1 and Q2 among the T queries. Another easy to handle case is when the answer of a new query uh, is the input salt of a repeated mouse query. Here we save by omitting the answer of the new query uh, and uh, uh, putting the indices of the new and the repeated mouse queries in the input. The index of the new query can be encoded in log t bits, uh, while the in index of the repeated mouse query needs roughly log of u times b bits because there are roughly at most uh, u times b uh, repeated uh, mouse queries in total. And this gives a sufficient amount of savings. We'll now see an example of a case uh, that is much harder to do. Uh, consider the case when the mouse structure has some repeated mouse query, but none of the input solves of repeated mouse queries is the answer to a new query. In this case, our strategy would be to omit the answer of the new query and instead remember the indices of the new and the repeated mouse queries and the path back from the input salt of the repeated mouse query to the answer of the new query. Note that uh, one can find a new query and repeated mouse query uh, such that this path consists entirely of repeated non-mouse queries, which had been already been made before running on the current sort. But how do we encode this path? <clears throat> Let us zoom in. Uh, we can remember the edges back for every node in the path. But there might be a large number of incident edges uh, for every node in the path. Uh, we say that uh, the query graph has no large multi collision if there is no node in the query graph that has in degree exceeding log u. In case uh, the query graph has no large multi collision, uh, we can encode the path back using the following number of bits. Uh, we encode the path length using log u bits and uh, uh, each edge requires log of log u bits. Uh, this strategy turns out uh, to give us enough savings uh, in case there are no large multiples. But what if there are large multiples? In this case, our key idea is to save from the large multi collision itself. Uh, so, if a node in the query graph has in degree m, uh, we say that it is a m uh, multi collision. Our strategy to save from an m multi collision is to remember only the answer of, uh, of the first of the m queries and encode the indices of the rest of the queries as a set. Uh, we save these bits for omitting the answer of m minus 1 queries, but incur this loss to encode the set of indices. Now it turns out that when m is at least log u, we save more than delta, uh, which suffices for us. Of course, the full formal proof needs to handle several subtleties, and I refer you to our paper for all the details. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we prove the STB conjecture uh, for all constant values of B and for some other parameter ranges by characterizing the structure of collisions uh, in the Merkel-Damgaard construction. 
uh, in a follow-up work by Akshima et al., thus uh, one of our results were improved that resulted in a proof of the STB conjecture when ST square is at most n. Also in a different follow-up work by us along with Cody Freitag, uh, the similar question of characterizing hardness of short sponge uh, collisions was studied. The main open problem that stems from this work is proving the STB conjecture or coming up with better attacks for the regime ST squared greater than n. The full version of our paper is on ePrint. Thank you. <laughs>